Hello everybody, this is Con and today I am driving the Mitsubishi Outlander 2.0 So um, the Outlander in Malaysia okay, was first launched in 2016 I remember that very well because uh, the Outlander was the Outlander's first launch Okay, at the time the media drive it was my first media drive with Carlist. So, uh, yeah, so that was in 2016. At that time, it was fully imported from Japan. Then later on, Mitsubishi beca began assembling the Outlander locally, which, you know, naturally brought prices down. Okay, initially, the Outlander was available only as a 2.4. And uh, I've already driven the 2.4 fairly recently during the Cars of Malaysia drive. Uh, video was already up uh, uh, during at that time. I'm including the link to that video in the description section below. Check that out. Okay, so uh, this two liter model is a more recent addition to the range. It is also locally assembled. Okay, uh, at present, okay, without GST, without SST, on the road price is 132,000 ringgit without insurance it is 14000 cheaper than the 2.4 okay and uh, for for the different for the price difference of course you get a smaller engine with reduced power you also get reduced equipment but at first glance it is not readily apparent so uh, later during the walk around i'm just i'm going to be highlighting what the, the difference differences in equipment between this and the 2.4 but suffice to say right at first glance there is no evident difference between this and the 2.4 so the important point right off the start to note is that if you buy an outlander and you choose the two liter model right to an onlooker it does not immediately look like you have made the lower the lower choice lower of two choices so that is a good thing right it means that mitsubishi right from the onset they start you off at a high entry level and they give you the option to move even higher so without further ado we adjourn outside for the walk around okay guys so from the outside okay this outlander 2.0 right at one glance uh the differences between this and the 2.4 may not be necessarily be obvious because the 2.0 also gets much of what uh, you will find in the 2.4 okay so the first difference of course are the rims the 2.4 gets 18 inch wheels 2.0 here gets 17 inch wheels the 2.4 would have had a spoiler here 2.0 does not get it not a big deal okay not a big deal at all okay you get a reverse camera here for the for the 2.0 where's the reverse camera ah, okay here's the reverse camera for the 2.0 2.4 gets uh gets a 360 degree camera now here's the interesting thing the 2.4 okay sensors 2.4 gets reverse sensors but the 2.0 gets front and rear sensors okay the the rationale of this i think is quite obvious because the 2.0 does not have a 360 degree camera so mitsubishi gives you uh Front parking sensors instead whereas for the 2.4 you already have 360 degree camera you don't actually need front parking sensors but here's an interesting thing check this out so right here at the at the driver side door right at the driver side panel or rather so you have actually two parking sensor switches okay you have there's this one that shows the you know the typical and then it shows the cone right so this is this is a standard uh, symbol for parking sensors and this one says front this one shows sonar now here's the interesting thing when I press this switch versus I press this switch the tactile feel is different okay and you notice okay this the, the tactile feel of this switch and say another switch up here is actually closer to this one than it is to this one this one has a uh, audible click when I, when you press it whereas this one does not okay so the op so from here you can draw a simple conclusion the outlander okay this outlander 2.0 the ckd kit 
that came from Japan only has reverse sensors. Okay, and you notice, uh, you see the reverse sensor module, the module of the reverse sensor and the module of the front parking sensor is different one. So, the CKD kit of the Outlander 2.0 would have come from Japan offering only reverse sensors. The front parking sensors are an initiative, are a locally added initiative by Mitsubishi Motors Malaysia. Yeah, so the front parking sensors are locally added. The rear parking sensors, okay, they would have, they come together with the car's CKD kit as well. Not, not something major, but you know, just for your information. Func on, from a functional perspective, they work fine enough. Okay, so another omission from the liter model would be power tailgate okay now the interesting thing about the outlander's power tailgate is that it is only a power closing okay opening whether you are you are using the 2.0 or the 2.4 the tailgate is being pushed up by these uh, pneumatic struts okay so uh as i've shown you in my video of the 2.4 liter model by offering only power closing mitsubishi is able to you know offer the power operation of a tailgate using a relatively compact motor mounted by the side here so here with the 2.0 it's manual opening manual closing okay uh the tailgate well does not feel ridiculously heavy so it is not something that is too burdensome to operate okay so here right here this we have the seats now here deployed in seven seater uh configuration and we have the tonio covers stowed away and secured nicely uh, under this compartment here you notice that you know there's an actual slot in which the tonio cover is uh, is securely fastened and i appreciate that so this uh this compartment here looks big enough it's uh you can stow away many of your small items on top of it then you can put your bigger items here as well so to fold the seats down okay folding the seats down is, is, is you just pull this strap and wait sorry uh, right hand all right so pull this and you push it down this flap goes down to give you a, f a relatively flat floor okay same here pull this pull down okay so this flap, this flap here gives you a relatively flat loading floor and you notice that now in five seater configuration okay there, there are two slots here in which the tonio cover can be fastened as per your picking so it's up to you lah to decide where you want to mount your tonio cover and that suggests that the middle row has a uh, adjustable recline which we'll explore later so you noteworthy features here at the back uh, you get a 12 volt socket hidden under here very useful and you get a cup holder on two a pair of cup holders on this side and well what is this a pen tray here on this side i guess yeah so let's go to the front passenger seat so here in the middle row okay uh let's explore the seat folding functions here uh so the thing about the outlander okay so to fold this down okay uh to you you want to extend your cargo hold right it's a two-step operation you have to lift this lower cushion okay. okay lift this lower cushion and you notice this uh this uh what you call it uh, this lever here you have to push this lever forward and then so it's not a two-step it's a three-step operation then you fold this down okay so i go over to the other side now what happens if I don't lift that up? So that, that essentially means when I pull this lever, this seat slides forward for you to access the third row, which we will explore later in greater detail. Right, so once again, repeat the procedure, pull this up, okay? Flip this lever, come down, okay? So, here we have it. This is the full loading floor. As we showed in an, in an earlier video, this space is big enough for 180 of Autobuzz's cones. And it is a decently flat surface, which means that, you know, 
all those I all those cones that were transported there weren't gaps in which they can fall into yeah so i always appreciate that you know for suvs when they design the seat folding mechanism or mpvs for that matter they always make sure that the floor is as flat as possible okay so now let's push this back up and put this back in now here's this so here's this the seat belt uh here's this uh, what you call the seat belt buckle you have to put this up first Okay, this one mount this here. This is to ensure that when you put this the seat cushion back, they don't get hidden underneath. And yeah, so this is the rear seat. And now I step inside. Okay, now I step inside here. This seat has forward backward adjustment. So this is well as far forward as it will go and this is as far back as it will go right and i believe there should be a recline adjustment okay then there's no lever here there's no lever down here which i can seemingly pull so i'm guessing i'm gonna have to pull this one to adjust the recline which i can go as far back as this okay this is this is my recline adjustment which is not too bad okay and i've got pretty decent leg room at the back here okay uh, so if I were, sit, were to sit properly the thigh support is okay uh, at least the seat cushion reaches almost to the back of my knee which is good and here's the armrest it's just a very very simple armrest with two molded cup holders that's it All right so for the middle passenger you have to you have to voila it's a ceiling mounted buckle you have to pull this down buckle here and then this one goes in here right and let's look at the back so to get on board push this up okay this one has this one is fixed lah, huh? so get inside Just enough leg room, a uh, headroom for my 170 cm frame, but I don't think I want to be here for an extended journey. So um, I would guess that you know if you are sitting here in an outland in the middle row of an outlander, and if there are passengers at the back row, please be considerate and move your seats a bit forward. As you can see, there is no such thing as thigh support whatsoever or leg room this is just like a space for you to chuck someone in here and that's it um, I would say that this is good for for an adult this is good for a short trip around the city but if you're talking about a longer distance trip better reserve this space here for a small kid okay nothing bigger than a small ch child yeah Right, so, but at least getting in and out is easy enough. The seat was pushed forward fairly easily. And getting down, no big problem. Right, so, come to the front. And, uh, well, so here's a look at the door card. As you can see, fabric upholstery inserts here. Hard plastic, not so hard plastic. Got this trim insert here as well got a decent length door pocket but occupies only about a third of the door's length speaker here and uh, so here's the here's the cabin here's a look at the front section of the cabin dashboard um, so step inside and oh yeah so one one more major one more differentiation between this and the 2.4 2.4 gives you uh, electric driver seat adjustment 2.0 is manual but hey look if adjusting a, your seats yourself seriously is it shouldn't be a big deal huh? you still get keyless entry okay and uh, so it's a very simple instrument cluster with uh, with a what you call it uh, with a multi-info display let me just mute that let me just mute that so um, you've got well, it is a colored multi-info display, okay, as you see in 
other Mitsubishi models like the ASX, the Lancer. Yeah, so uh, it shows you your cruising range, your trip meter, average fuel consumption, average speed, and all service reminder and all that. Lah. Okay, so nothing fancy here. Okay, you got steering mounted controls, you got cruise control, audio controls, and um, so here you also get an active four wheel drive button here. So this button here, pressing this button, chooses different four wheel drive modes. So you have four wheel drive lock. Okay, you have four wheel drive eco. Four wheel drive eco basically is predominantly front wheel drive and only uh, power is sent to the rear when needed. Okay, four wheel drive auto uh, gives you more use of the rear rear axle. Okay, but it is still predominantly front wheel drive in this stage, right? Uh, four wheel drive lock, to my understanding, it's not really a 50 50 lock, okay, but uh, it is still a front biased all wheel drive system. But once again, you get further increase in usage of the rear axle, right? And um, so here you get a double DIN touchscreen unit. I'm fairly certain this is a locally sourced unit, okay. And uh, yeah, so go to the apps. You get settings. Yeah, well, it's um, it's a functional unit, not the f not the fanciest in the market, but it works. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here you've got two zone climate control. And uh, down here, cigarette lighter. You've got two USB chargers, which is fantastic. Okay, 2.1 amps, 1.5 amps. This cup holders here, and this, you know, rubber layers here, which you can remove and wash in case it gets dirty. But overall, right, uh, this is this is a nicely finished center console. I like this material, but this usage of space is rather poor because this whole area, to me, is wasted. Okay, uh, the 2.0 gets a mechanical parking brake, which for me is yay. 2.4 gets electronic parking brake. I don't see why Mitsubishi couldn't standardize between two. Just I I offer either electronic or mechanical. Why do you need two different ones? To me, it doesn't make sense, right? And uh, so you've got you've got the glove box, you've got a center console box. This is a big center console box, right? Uh, you've got a tray here and inside okay inside you've got another cigarette lighter and a USB port so now as we all know right one big weakness of the Outlander's cabin is that it lacks rear aircon vents which on its own is not too bad but see the funny thing is that the front air vents are also not very effectively deployed because you see you have one at the side here one at the side here this one normal it is the middle ones that it's a bit funny because you see this one blows directly at the face of the front passenger this one blows directly at the driver's hand so you know when the driver's hand is cold this one will have to be closed and as a result this vent is rendered entirely useless so uh yeah not on so the fun the thing about the outlander i'm not sure who did the the air, air conditioning design of this car but really uh that to me does not look properly thought out but um overall quality of the cabin is decent right everything feels well fit and finish feels good and you know it is a space the interior feels spacious but really lot uh lack of internal storage space aircon definitely needs a full-on rethink so with the 2.0 you also don't get pedal shifters but you get an extra mode here on in the cvt this is the mitsubishi invex 3 cvt uh software okay hardware is from jetco this is a the hardware is a jetco transmission which uh, interestingly enough, it's also shared with the Kizashi, Suzuki Kizashi. It is also shared with the Nissan Silphy, right? And so you get a gated shifter, okay? And you get this extra position, okay? 
you've got drive okay in the 2.4 it, it would have been neutral drive and L but here in the 2.0 without um, without pedal shifters you get an extra DS mode that will activate a sportier uh, shifting pattern so yeah the Outlander's cabin uh, decently built some design flaws here and there uh, but usable enough it is spacious and nicely finished okay so the first time i drove the outlander was in 2016 that time they just launched the cbu model and mitsubishi uh, organized the media drive that took us from kl down to jb now my initial impressions uh, at that time were not entirely positive because even with a 2.4 liter engine the outlander actually felt lethargic felt underpowered and worst of all it was not very efficient on fuel so many of my friends who went along with their drive quite easily emptied the fuel tank in just one direction yeah you usually expect an SUV of this size to hold a bit more fuel when you reach JB but the Outlander emptied the tank by the time we got there so when Mitsubishi later launched this 2 liter model I was not entirely optimistic of its prospects because already the 2.4 uh, was not inspiring in terms of performance I really would not expect the 2.0 to be you know any good to drive and then came the recent COM 2018 convoy in which I drove the Outlander 2.4 from uh, Penang to Trangano and I was positively surprised. That car definitely felt improved over the, C, uh, the CPU model. It, the, the engine was more responsive, fuel economy also not, has uh, improved noticeably. So the, it actually, it, it seemed that you know Mitsubishi tweaked the engine settings a little, optimized the combustion in there, gave the car, made the car feel more responsive, yet at the same time uh, improved the fuel economy a bit. So it was a bit, it, it drove a lot better than I remember. Um, of course, my opinion on SUVs of this size is that you're always better off with a diesel engine or at least a turbocharged petrol yeah so a two liter petrol engine uh, that is the chukup makan option in this category like you have you do have the likes of the crv the x trail the cx5 all offering two liter petrol engines as the entry level model right and so that the two liter engine has become the benchmark of this segment okay whereby this that is this uh, it, it is the minimum expectation of the segment and i think consumers also accept that the 2 liter and petrol engine at this segment gives you gives a sufficiently appealing balance of running costs road tax fuel consumption and adequate performance so how does the outlander 2.0 you know drive then how does it cope with the reduced uh, outputs from the 2.4 the answer is that right if you're talking about in town driving and all the cvt does a fair job in masking the deficit in outputs so for example right now i am going i am coming to a complete stop okay and full throttle start it, it actually takes off with you know with respectable levels of push not the fastest if you see a Tiguan or you see a CX-5 or you see a CRV turbo move aside ah huh? but at the very least it does the engine does not feel like it is laboring to kick this thing into motion where this engine really struggles will be on the highways when you are trying to carry high speed that is when you you may find the engine to run out of breath the biggest criticism of this engine is i would say its lack of refinement now this 4 beat 11 engine okay uh has a very interesting history because 
this engine is co-developed with Hyundai. So, you know the Hyundai Theta 2 engine? Shares the same block with, with, with this guy, with this one, with the, with the 4B, you know, in 11 here, or the 2.4 liter 4B12 that we once saw in the Lancer Sportback. Okay, but the internals are different. Like, the block is the same, but Mitsubishi has its own internals. Hyundai engine has its own internals. But one thing I've noticed about, you know, this uh, this engine, okay, whether it is the Mitsubishi version or the Hyundai version, they tend to be a bit rough. Okay, when you when you floor the engine, oh, they are the, the sound is not at all uh, inspiring and it doesn't help that, you know, this the rubber band effect of the CVT stretching the revs and all. So, yeah, it is uh, it is a functional engine. It is it has it is an engine that that pulls you along, but it is not an engine from which you derive much in the way of driving enjoyment, okay? which is unfortunate. Yeah. So, to me, uh, just like I conclude with most SUVs, this and uh, this car best served with a diesel engine. The handling front offers far more positive news, okay? Uh, the ride comfort is very, very well sorted. And for a car this tall, this big, the handling is actually pretty good. If you have watched my Gunting Run video, you would see that the Outlander's chassis actually allows you, gives you the confidence to carry an impressive amount of speeds into bends okay it helps that this car has four-wheel drive like I, that's why i always say right i always prefer my suvs to have four-wheel drive this one has it and you it con it gives you further confidence okay like okay pre predominantly right this suvs in this segment okay even the all-wheel drive models uh they are mostly driven or they mostly drive almost the front wheels the power is only sent to the rear wheels when it's needed but you know when your right height when your center of gravity is higher than it is in a regular sedan or hatchback it is good to have that option to be able to divert some power to the rear when you need it which gives you that added stability if you want to power your way out of bed and I must say the Outlander, it does not have a lot of power. Okay, uh, getting this thing up to speed is a lot of work. But at the very least, right, once you earn all that speed, when you approach a bend, you don't have to shave off too much of it. You can carry a lot of your, your hard-earned speed into a corner, no problem. And also, uh, something that we discovered during our COM drive with the 2.4 litre model. Uh, the Outlander's chassis also is capable of taking a bit of outroading uh, action. So, if you are, I mean, we are not talking about, about the hardcore 4x4 stuff that you would take a Hilux into, but we are, if you are talking about rough terrain, sandy terrain, muddy terrain, the Outlander will go. The Outlander can take it, no problem, right? And in fact, right, this, the Outlander and the Subaru Forester are the only two SUVs in this segment which I would really have the confidence to abuse off-road, yeah. Other, the other guys, the CRVs, the CX-5s, the X-Trails and all, these are urban warriors. But the Outlander, the Forester, these two, I have a bit more confidence taking them off the tarmac. So, overall conclusion, relative to its peers, right? the Outlander, in, you know, in terms of size versus price, fantastic value. Okay, for what 130 over thousand ringgit for this two liter model, you are getting 
a properly spacious seven-seater SUV very very respectably equipped you put this next to a 2.4 you look at it and you don't feel like you know you have you are too severely punished for choosing the lesser model some cars you know when you choose the entry model you sit inside there are many things missing in the car to remind you that you have not done well in life well enough in life to afford the better option that is why you are stuck with buying the cheaper car but with the outlander right whatever things that mitsubishi omitted are things that you don't notice at first glance you don't really feel it on a day-to-day -day basis and consequently right you, you you it makes you feel that you know you are you are just if you you don't mind losing these items on the basis of having saved a good more than ten thousand ringgit versus if you had chosen the 2.4 now of course i i definitely recommend that you choose the 2.4 if you can afford it but the message here is that this two liter model is not an embarrassing choice by any stretch of the imagination the only complaint, the only two complaints I have about the Outlander in general, and this actually applies to 2.4 as well, is that the engine is not suited for not suitable for the car. A car this weight, a naturally aspirated petrol engine, you need 2.5 liters upwards in order to have respectable performance. 2 liter, 2.4 not suitable at all the second but i think to many it is the most major complaint no real air convents um it's okay if on a on a rainy day like this but in under bright sunshine i suspect that may be an issue to some and from me for me personally you know uh as as a father who with kid with a kid at the back, you know, always strapped into a child seat, not having a real real aircon when right on a hot day is a bit of an issue. Yeah, and I think I've mentioned this before. Uh, for me and my wife, we have already decided that our next car purchase must have real air conditioning. Otherwise, it's it is the it would be a non-starter to, to begin with. So. That is the biggest issue of the Outlander, the, the lack of rear air comments. But there is a saving grace because I hear, I'm not 100% sure of this, but I hear there are aftermarket solutions whereby uh, you can install okay, uh, a module here uh, right above where my head is. So what it does is that it has a, the module has a fan inside that sucks the cool air from the front and blows it to the rear. So uh, this solution is already used in uh, vehicles like uh, I mean, car already comes from the factory. You know, like car. The, I think what the Ertiga has this has this setup. Uh, the Honda BRV has this setup. You know, they have a fan unit here that sucks the cool air that was already blown that's circulating here and blows it further back. I think that really would make for a very acceptable solution because the problem with the outlander is that mitsubishi did not design this car with rear air conditioning in mind i do not know how they could have made this blunder but that's what i was told so they could not there is no there is no provision for rear air con piping in this car yeah so yeah, so I hear that aftermarket solution is something that you guys may want to consider. Uh, if if that if if that's if such a thing does not exist, I'm sure somebody should take the effort to make such a thing because that that would have, that would really uh, solve one of the Outlanders' biggest uh, Achilles heels. Because otherwise, right, this is a very very uh, very usable and very practical SUV and pretty good to drive yeah All right so thanks for watching and uh, if you like my videos click the subscribe button below and until my next video thanks for watching bye for now